There we go. Wonderful. Welcome back to AIM Research. This event is hosted by the Center for Academic Innovation and aims to act as a center for conversation, inspiration, and research to inform educational innovation of all kinds. If you have ideas for people we should invite to come join us for one of these, please do send them my way. We are keeping a list and we're looking forward to the next year of scheduling. We're starting to think about that, so would really welcome suggestions. You can check out all of Academic Innovation's events at ai.umich.edu slash events. And in particular, we're hoping you will go register for our spring showcase, April 26th from 4 to 6 p.m. We are going to throw a registration link in the chat, and we are so excited for uh, that upcoming event and hope you will come join us. Today's presentation will be recorded and posted to our CAI YouTube channel after. Feel free to submit questions for our speaker in the Zoom chat. If you have clarifying questions, I'll try to surface those and make sure that we're able to engage with those as we go. Um, and then we'll hold all of the larger discussion questions for the end of the talk. I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Yu to join us today. Dr. Yu is an assistant professor of learning analytics and educational data mining at Teachers College, Columbia University. He is a research affiliate at Community College Research Center and a faculty member of the Data Science Institute. Dr. Yu's research interests include learning analytics, higher education, applied data science, computational social science, and responsible artificial intelligence. At the core of his research agenda is equity-oriented educational data science, which investigates how emerging data science techniques can help understand and improve educational and social equity. Take it away. Stage is yours. All right. Uh, can everyone hear me well? Okay. We okay. Keep. So, uh, okay, cool. So good afternoon or morning where you are, like everyone. Uh, thank you, Kay, for the generous introduction. Um, I've actually been a big fan of the impactful work at the Center of Academic Innovation. I have friends and colleagues in Michigan as well. So, you know, it's very, very much of a pity that, that this talk cannot happen in person. Um, but it's really a great, great honor for me um, to share my work here anyways. So um, this talk will be mostly a bit focused on one recent paper, but I'll also talk a little bit more broadly about my research. So, oops. Okay. So, um, well, Kate already mentioned a little bit like my research agenda, but overall, you know, my, uh, I, I see myself as an educational data scientist and my core research goal is around like, how can we use data science for educational equity? So this comes in, you know, a few uh, specific directions. So the broader context is that now, you know, well, we have talked, we have been talking about big data in education, but I think people are like, people at, 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 at the center are, are definitely not unfamiliar with this. And so there's a huge potential for data science techniques um, to help us address issues in education and equity. Um, so in my research, I have three lines that really approach this uh, goal, the journey approaches this goal. This goal. Uh, one is more from a scientific inquiry perspective, how can we leverage data science and novel forms of data to have more granular understanding of existing inequalities. You know, traditionally, we understand educational inequalities from perspective of achievement gaps um, or some like, you know, um, um, you know, understanding of students' learning processes on a smaller scale. Um, but overall with the big data, we have to, you know, we, we have, we have, there is a possibility to understand these inequalities on a very large scale over time. Um, to really inform um, the, the, you know, the science of uh, educational inequality. So the second line of research is more like you know, practice oriented, like you know, with data science uh, techniques, uh, we can develop data applications um, to really support existing practices, you know, institutional instructional practices to support students and especially for the sake of the goal of uh, educational equity. And, actually related to both of the first two directions. Uh, nowadays, with more and more you know, data science and algorithms being used in the education system, uh, we have the concerns that, okay, these algorithms per se might, create, might bring in new forms of inequality or, or in, in, you know, in the form of bias or, or, or other notions. So <laughs> we need to be really careful about the unintended consequences of using various, you know, data science algorithms, either for scientific inquiry or for, or to support practices. So the third line of my research is really to investigate algorithm fairness, uh, really in the wild, which means that uh, when algorithms are really being used in the educational system at different levels, uh, what are the, you know, uh, implications uh, and what are the potential kind of uh, bias 
very uh, like biased consequences um, uh, of, of these applications. So, so this overall is kind of my uh, research agenda. And today I'll be mostly talking about one recent paper uh, in collaboration uh, with uh, three of my wonderful colleagues uh, at University of Virginia, Kettleberg, uh, Ben Castleman, and Yifan Song. Uh, so uh, this paper is under a uh, second round of review and hopefully it'll get published soon. Um, but overall, this is an extension of some existing, uh, of, of the decade of learning analytics research and my own research as well from a lot of times, you know, uh, smaller scale, uh, more kind of, you know, better resource context to a kind of large scale, lower resource context. Uh, so the title is, the, is, is here, it's, the title is very broad, but I'll talk about it more, uh, uh, more, more about the detail of it. So the broader context is, is of, of this study is predictive analytics in higher education. So um, we probably are all familiar with this. You know, this is not a new topic in higher education. You know, back even back in 2016 that I'm referencing here, there was already a landscape report on the use of predictive analytics in higher education. So, um, so there are a lot of like potential, uh, you know, like use cases uh, for predictive analytics of predictive analytics, such as for either at instructional level uh, using predictive analytics to um, create adaptive learning experience or at a kind of program level, uh, they can support uh, targeted advising uh, practices or even at an institutional level, they can be used to you know, facilitate resource allocation such as enrollment management, that kind of thing. So predict analytics, as you know, is usually taken in a series of student level predictors and try to give every student a certain like predicted outcome or sometimes a risk score right, uh, to inform any kind of you know, supporting practice yeah. to target it. Like, yeah. um, and, 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 and so, so uh, yeah, so these are uh, really, you know, well, you know, these are really widely used actually in the higher education system. Uh, and according to some like, you know, recent reports, you know, over one third of all higher education institutions have invested in some sort of like predictive analytics, either from private vendors or like in a homegrown manner. Uh, and collectively, these institutions really spend uh, hundreds of hundreds of millions of dollars to generate these predictions, right, from different sources uh, from different sources of these tools. And if we define predictive analytics more broadly, because sometimes they're used to, you know. Uh, inform some like uh, to create some alerts or inform some practice. And if we you know, define predictive analytics more broadly and focus on this uh, more under-resourced context like community colleges, like over around like 80% of community colleges are actually adopting some variation of con uh, congratulatory, congratulatory and alert system to uh, student success. These are not necessarily in the form of you know, algorithm-based like predictive analytics, but it's kind of, you know, trying to identify risk factors and trying to, you know, generate some alerts, right, either from algorithms or from human insights is really prevalent because it's really, you know, what institutions uh, need to do to better support students. So when it comes to building predictive analytics, one important factor is data, right? So we need to actually choose the different data and generate the specific, uh, you know, predictors um, to be predictive to pre build predictive analytics. And we, and this is actually not a super easy decision because one, um, nowadays with the more and more different data sources and larger and larger volumes of data, the management of big data might involve logistic or financial costs for institutions. And two, these different predictors or data sources, they might not capture the same amount or same part of the predictive signal across different student groups, right? Like when, talk, when we think about like education equity, we might be really careful about that. So, so, so in any case, uh, choosing the right, not necessarily, you know, there's probably not, not a single right, but choosing data sources and specific predictors to build predictive analytics is really crucial uh, in practice. And I list three common data sources that we use uh, for predictive analytics, uh, administrative records, which have been there forever since we have institutions. Nowadays, they're more and more available in digitized formats. Uh, digital behavior, this is actually the most recent one data source that represents actually the big data era in education. Right? We, we, we didn't use to have this on a large scale or at an institutional level. 
And this is also a primary driver of learning analytics research and practice in the past day, decade. Uh, and lastly, survey research, uh, you know, which is also like has a long history, rather right, like used by researchers, but also practitioners to get like students in, to get students their own, own input, to get their self reports of their experience and challenges and all the kind of aspects that we care about. Um, so uh, I'm most, I'm talking a little bit more about like, like, you know, uh, digital behavioral data. Um, and in higher education, one of the biggest source of digital behavioral, uh, you know, one of the biggest source of digital behavioral data is learning management systems, right? So uh, everyone is very familiar, should, should be very familiar with this. And this, you know, as a digital tool, it has almost be part of the fundamental, like, like foundational infrastructure of almost all higher education institutions. I think some uh, market reports that uh, cover that, um, you know, overall, you know, the institutions that adopt some sort of learning management systems are over like 99% of all of them. And from this kind of market share plot uh, or, or illustration, uh, and you can see there are not that many vendors, like, you know, the, the, the you know, uh, the three largest uh, vendors of learning management system, they have like really served the majority of institutions, which actually means that there is a potential to have more um, accessible and more generalizable uh, analytic solutions just because, you know, there are a lot of institutions, a lot of students who are using the same kind of system every day. So from learn, so a caveat is like a, a caveat is that definitely from learning perspective, we know that like learning management system is not a learning system, right? It might not be the best type of tool to say, okay, we capture students' really cognitive development processes and that kind of thing. But on the other hand, from a practical perspective, this is, I think you can, it's hard to find another system or another kind of tool that's more widely available, that's more widely used by individual students and institutions. So actually the data we get from there, uh, they have their, you know, they have their deficits, but they are able, you know, they are able to serve the purpose of understand students, uh, understanding student experience on a large scale and in a very generalizable manner. So that's a caveat I wanna mention here. So, and in terms of the data they get, like, you know, for building predictive analytics, um, we know, you know, the, there are a lot of like you know, reasons for why we want to use this kind of data or, or like potential advantages of them. You know, they're scalable, um, they're very granular, right, compared to administrative data or uh, survey data. They're actionable because, of, you know, partially because they're scalable and granular. Uh, they're, they're about student behavior, which are kind of more malleable than some of the than, than, than the insights gotten from like the student background information. And also they're non-intrusive, unlike survey data, you know, you have to interrupt students a lot. And these data are just like generated there. They, they're just there. They generate every day as students, uh, instructors, institutions are using them. So due to these characteristics, LMS data has been very much used in learning analytics research in the past decade. It's very much used, yes. So, but even so there are still gaps that we need to fill to translate the data into you know, data analytics and into real world benefits. So next I'll show you where the gaps are. And based on, so this is based on, on actually over 200 empirical studies uh, using LMS data in higher education. Uh, no, this is just like a, a kind of, you know, a, a side project that, 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 that I'm working on, um, but basically trying to see how LMS data have been used in the existing research. And, and two of the gaps I'm identifying here to inform this current study. One is how many courses are examined in empirical studies using LMS data in higher education? So I, I'm looking at this, it's, it's mostly thinking about like from a practical perspective, right? If you want to do any institution level investment in, um, in this kind of data analytics, we need to better understand the canvas white value of the data. Um, and as you can see here, a lot of, or the majority of learning analytics research, empirical research that has leveraged this kind of data in higher education settings, they focus on a few courses. This is reasonable and it serves the scientific inquiry purpose very well because, you know, with a few courses, we can delve into, uh, you know, the context, uh, you know, we can delve into student behavioral, uh, in the specific context and understand 
uh, you know, students' learning processes and connect that to theory of learning better. Uh, but from a practical perspective, uh, this doesn't directly inform whether institutions should make more investment into using this kind of data. So this is a big gap so far in literature. Uh, we don't really know, right? Like, you know, if from a practical perspective, well, from a practical perspective, how, how valuable this data is across many courses. And only, you see only a very, a handful of, a handful of studies out of these 200 something studies have, have leveraged this kind of data on the, uh, across many courses. Uh, another existing gap is about where the empirical research occur. So across this over 200 studies in the past decade or so, I think this almost covers every single study that you can find that uses LMS data in higher education context. So I try to I, I, I try to see right like in what kind of institutional context these studies are performed. Um, so some rough taxonomy of these institutional context research intensive distance education Korean oriented institutions out there. So there's the majority of uh, these empirical studies happen in research intensive universities or institutions, uh, regardless of the country, like they try to identify, you know, type of institution, even outside of US, but still, uh, most of them happen in research intensives. And there's, you know, uh, over here, uh, down here, a lot of studies don't directly reveal like what institutions um, they're working with to do the study, but, uh, but, but 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 in most of these cases, I can infer that you know the institution is the author's institution, which is also a research intensive university. So overall, this means that we do not know the value of LMS data in much more under resourced settings, like you know the career or mostly like the Korean or career oriented kind of institutional concept I mentioned here, even though there's so many studies in the past in the past decade, right? So but on the other hand, both these kind of under-resourced institutions and the students they enroll, actually they might be benefiting the most from this data analytics, but the context and the student populations are very different from like students at University of Michigan and, and institutions like that, right? So this is another gap in the existing uh, literature. Although LMS data for data analytics, neither of these is very, sounds very, you know, sexy, like in terms of research wise or, or, or but just from a practical perspective, there are still like gaps here. So this informs the research goal of uh, this study, which is how useful are LMS data for institutional-wide predictive analytics in more under-resourced context. So we do this study in the context of a statewide uh, community college system uh, of Virginia. So it includes 23 community colleges in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And together, these colleges enroll um, around um, 250,000 students per year. Um, and so we want to do this kind of, you know, system-wide LMS data-based uh, predictive analytics. Um, so the LMS uh, is Canvas in this system, which was formally transitioned or formally adopted and, 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 um, and used uh, in summer 2019. And so, you know, the design of the study is there's not, not nothing too fancy. Uh, we are just using these two years of data uh, and student population. Um, so to do predictive analytics, uh, students, we include students uh, who took any MVCCS courses uh, that, uses, that use Canvas uh, through the two years of span, uh, excluding the spring 2020 because you know, there was a disruption uh, due to COVID-19. And we use both, and we, we get both admission records, uh, including background and course enrollment records, as well as all the raw log data, uh, raw log data uh, from Canvas. Uh, so finally, we build this analytics based on over 2,000 courses across these 23 institutions and across um, on 226,000 students uh, through um, this period. And this overall covered. Um, 81% of the entire, you know, administrative records, because some courses don't really use Canvas, right? Uh, or use LMS, but the data that we have available from this LMS, from the LMS data, uh, accounted for 81% of the total. 
So a, a really quick uh, look at a student population uh, at these kind of community colleges. So uh, around six, nearly 60% are female uh, and nearly half of them are people of color. Uh, and you know, they're you know, in community colleges, the student populations are quite different in terms of age. The average age is like 24. And there are a lot of students who are much older than that. Um, and the cumulative GPA, by the time uh, they took these courses um, that we analyzed, uh, were uh, a little bit below uh, 3.0. So the predictive analytics. Uh, so as you know, the first study of our series projects, uh, we're just doing we're doing a proof of concept like course performance predictions, uh, where we use each student in each, the data for each student in each course uh, to predict their course performance. Um, and we predict, we specifically predict whether uh, the students would get an ABC or not uh, in the target course. Uh, and this threshold is based on uh, the, you know, the institution's understanding of you know, what it means to be at risk uh, for a given student. And to highlight that like, you know, if in the four, at a four, usually at four year institutions, probably uh, the majority of students would get C and above. But overall, across all the sample, uh, across the entire sample, all the courses we, we have, these, the rate between ABC versus DFW uh, is around like four to one. It's kind of, there are 20% overall students who will get a DFW uh, in these courses. So that's a much, you know, that's a much worse situation than uh, research intensive institutions. And predictors, we extract some admin predictors a lot of admin predictors. Uh, some of them are more about students, their own characteristic, and some of them are about um, the courses. Um, and we also extract a lot of like LMS predictors um, uh, based on their behavioral logs. Um, so specifically, we we include both. So we predict a student outcome in each individual course, uh, but we we included both, um, you know, behavioral beha behavioral predictors. Uh, within that course, but also within the concurrent courses that a student that a student enrolls, and also their behavioral patterns from their past courses. So, so we have early term for both the target course and the concurrent courses, early term predictors. And we also include the early term predictors and full term predictors for prior courses for each uh, data point that we want to predict. Uh, and we use some uh, we use a uh, random forest, which is you know widely used uh, for uh, prediction task, uh, and we do some standard training and testing. So we train uh, the predictive model on the first three, uh, first three uh, semesters, and you know, evaluate the performance on the most recent semester in the data set. Uh, so that like you know, it's not like using the same data, we train the model and, and predict um, student performance. So some results here. So note that we're you know using both admin data and LMS data. So there is a little bit of uh, uh, like like intention to compare the performance of these two data sources because admin data are usually more ready for institutions even for under resourced institutions because with all the you know uh, federal uh, reporting uh, responsibilities you know uh, they are kind of uh, you know easier to manage uh, whereas the LMS data are usually very hard uh, to manage for these under resourced institutions we want to see how much additional value they have compared to admin data. So some overall uh, results. Um, so we use uh, we use a C, st C statistic, uh, or uh, it can be alternatively called uh, area under curve, AUC, uh, which is a very commonly used metric uh, to evaluate prediction performance. Um, it can be think of as the probability that the model ran ranks a random ABC student uh, more highly than a random at risk student. So. This is a comparison um, between three different models. One is only using admin data, and one is only using the LMS data, and one is combining them. And we split the sample, no, what, so this is only when evaluating performance. So we split the sample into two parts. Uh, one, is, uh, one is for students who have enrolled over, so, or, or in other terms, returning students or continuing students who have enrolled in two or more terms. Whereas, and the other students who are in their first term. Uh, we do this split because 
for the first term students, they actually don't have some of the course rated admin, admin uh, predictors uh, because they haven't taken any classes before. Um, so, so there's some interesting pattern here, like you see, so the higher this metric is, the better uh, performance is, uh, or the better the model can predict student performance. So for returning students, we don't really see a marginal value for LMS data in terms of predictive utility. Uh, admin data captures better uh, the kind of predictive signal. Whereas for the first term, first time students, uh, actually LMS data can overperform admin data. Uh, and combining them in any case uh, with strength, you no, know, with with strength and predictive performance, which means that they have probably some complementary uh, signals in these two data sources. Uh, using some alternative metrics, one is true positive rate, which is the probability that an actual ABC student will be predicted as uh, doing well. As uh, um, so, similar like uh, that kind of differentiation is similar. Like you no, know, for returning students, LMS data doesn't show that much kind of marginal utility. Whereas uh, for first time students, uh, it's better. Um, and also, so this is like you know, for the ABC students, uh, how 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 well the models can identify them. Um, and on the other hand, for at risk students who get DFW, how well the model can pick them up. Uh, so this is the true negative rate, uh, the, pro the proportion of actual DFW students who are predicted as at risk. So similarly, uh, for returning students, uh, admin seems ad admin outperforms LMS, uh, whereas uh, the is the opposite for the first term students. And note that this true positive rate, positive rate is much higher than negative rate, which means that it's easier. The you know, it's easier for the model to identify a, a student who do, who's doing well than identifying a student who's at risk. So, because we're pulling together course level predictions right across two thousand courses, we still want to we want to see if the performance varies across different courses. So, we pick the largest uh, five fifty courses uh, with largest enrollment. Uh, and plot, you know, and evaluate the performance in each individual individual courses. Use the same metrics and see how this, uh, you know, performance varies across courses. So this is using the ALC uh, metric, and we see that, you know, uh, and, and this is like for all students without differentiating between returning and first time students, uh, so that you can see admin data performs better, like when putting all the students together. Um, but overall. The LMS only models have more variations across different courses uh, compared to admin or uh, combining them. Well, this is reasonable, right? Because there's a more, there's a much larger variation in terms of LMS usage uh, compared to admin data, which is standard across other students and courses. Uh, but we just want to kind of see how much this variation can be. You know, it can be as low as like you know, zero, 0 0.6 something. Uh, to 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 something as high as like you no know, zero point. Uh, H3. And delving deeper, we then look specifically at five gateway courses, uh, which typically function as gateways for students to take higher level courses and fulfill degree requirements across most programs of study. Well, I think the notion of gateway courses is also applicable in four year contests where we all have gate large gateway courses, uh, especially for uh, first year students. Um, so we look at five gateway courses with large enrollment. Uh, so overall, Per semester, these courses have many sections, but uh, but 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 putting them together, there are like five thousand to twenty thousand students uh, per semester uh, in this in each of these gateway courses, um, and usually they are they are you know usually they have uh, worse performance uh, compared to other courses. Usually the DFW rate is um, between twenty five to forty percent in these large gateway classes. So we we we. We develop some course specific models, uh, which means that the models are trained and tested on, on these course specific samples. We train the models on students who used to enroll in these gateway courses and evaluate on students who enroll in these gateway courses in the most recent semester. And again, we look at how, you know, we look at the performance uh, in each of these gateway courses. Uh, so it's still using the AUC metric. Um, and and when, when comparing, you know, the utility, so this is not differentiating between first time uh, versus returning students. So in this context, the gateway courses don't necessarily only enroll like uh, first time students. So actually we, we see variation 
in terms of, okay, this performance metric and also the comparative utility between admin data and LMS data, right? In some courses, for example, in this English class, the LMS data actually outperforms admin data, even with some returning students. And whereas in some math class, uh, you can see there's a larger gap between, you know, use admin only and LMS only courses. So this shows that, right, right the, you know, it's kind of reaffirming this kind of you know, variation in prediction performance uh, across different course contexts. And, and uh, as I mentioned, the, you know, the course context differences are mostly, you know, manifest in, you know, LMS usage, right? Um, so for these five gateway classes, we look at a little bit deeper, a look a little bit deeper at um, how, you know, the course contact, like the LMS usage uh, is different. Um, and by, by looking at overall student behavioral patterns. So we don't, well, we have not really looked at like, you know, uh, how the instructors use the LMS functions, but we look at, look at like how, you know, the overall levels of uh, student behavioral, of, of student behavior. So we look at overall, you know, the average uh, number of activities and time spent in the LMS system and uh, like, how, how much they usually post in discussion forums and compare you know, these class level averages uh, in each of these three uh, five gateway courses. And we can see there are some like, you know, contextual differences here. Like you see this English 111, which is, you know, where the LMS has the best comparative utility uh, compared to admin data. They overall have also more active LMS usage, you know, in terms of total time, total like actions, in terms of discussion posts. Whereas for math classes, where we find find that like LMS data are not as useful as admin data, you can see overall they have lower usage, right? So this is this is basically capturing the differences in LMS usage and how that would, you know, be related to the utility of LMS data in pre LMS data in pre building predictive analytics. So, you know, so this is a preliminary, you know, it's a first step um, towards um, more, you know, careful investigation of predictive analytics in these uh, community college settings. Um, but so far, uh, we provided, you know, probably the first system-wide evaluation of predictive analytics in these uh, settings. And in terms of the marginal value of LMS data, we find that it's no noticeable for new students but not for returning students. And also it varies significantly across our course context. Um, this, you know, the end goal of this is really to, you know, you know inform the cost benefit trade-off, right? When institutions want to invest in these kind of campus level big data analytics, especially for under-resourced institutions that have to be, really, to be really careful in making um, these investments. Um, so, What's next, uh, you know, in addition to this study is one, we're gonna um, more carefully audit and mitigate uh, the algorithm bias in these predictions, which we have not looked at uh, in this current study. And two, uh, we're trying to figure out um, like, because uh, eventually these predictive analytics uh, are supposed to support practices. Um, so we want to do some field evaluation of right, like the actual field effects of these analytics, like whether they do assist uh, with more effective or efficient or equitable resource allocation, right? Like support instructors, advisors, and all these uh, practitioners. So a note on each of these based on some of, you know, I have some side notes around this. So in terms of algorithm bias, uh, this is a old study that I had like in 2020, where I look at, you know, the, uh, out, like the, the the fairness or bias consequences of using different data sources for di for predictive analytics. Uh, in that context, in that context, it's a more research intensive context. But I did similar things of you know using admin versus LMS data to predict you know student performance and see whether they these algorithms would treat different students differently. So some takeaways from that study was like one. You know, using ad, using administrative records um, to do predictive analytics, um, and using LMS data, um, they actually complement each other uh, when predict when predicting both like short term and long term achievement, uh, which resonates what we find here at the system level. So back uh, back then, like that study was kind of based on ten courses, not a campus level investigation. 
Um, but more importantly, in terms of the fairness and bias consequences, back then what I found was using amnesty records actually tend to significantly under-evaluate marginalized student groups than even controlling for existing performance gaps. They would still like, tend to further under-evaluate uh, students from marginalized backgrounds, racial minorities, uh, you know, first-generation students. And compared to admin records, LMS data would actually lead to more uh, fair uh, predictions, just in terms of you know, the extent to which they under-evaluate or over-evaluate students. So that's what I found back then. Um, so we have, so, so, so the next step would be you know, looking at this you know, now in a different context on a campus-wide level um, to see uh, to see whether to, to, to identify the patterns of this bias and to find ways to mitigate them, if any, um, because that, that, that's, that, that's critical because uh, when we want to use these predictive analytics to foster, to improve education equity. Uh, the other point I was mentioning is about like, you know, a future direction is like, you know, field evaluation of analytics. So on, on, on that, uh, I've tried to identify, okay, what are the real world effects of of learning analytics, right? So I tried, I found like some kind of handful of review papers on um, try to summarize, trying to summarize the effects of learning analytics interventions. Um, so surprisingly, you know, there are not as many, you know, like rigorous field evidence on learning analytics interventions. I like I found three papers, each of them identifying 10 to 30-ish papers, but they overlap actually, you know, across these papers. Um, in higher education, uh, so, so these are all in higher education settings. So overall, we still don't have as much, you know, solid evidence on the effects of any kind of predictive analytics or other source of other types of learning analytics when they're deployed uh, in practice. Uh, so I think this is still, this represents another kind of gap in the existing kind of uh, research um, and practice as well. Well, I know like, you know, Center of Academic Innovation did a lot of like good like interventions and, and stuff using the tools you developed. So which actually contribute have which actually have contributed a lot um, to this kind of like, understanding of real world um, effects. But I think you know uh, this is still very much needed, especially in the under resourced context that I mentioned. So that concludes my uh, presentation today. I'm really happy to take any you know, comments and feedback. You know this is still like early kind of work um, and happy to also know uh, what people have been doing here at, 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 at Michigan. All right. That was wonderful. Thank you. I will invite our audience to, to you know, un, uh, come on screen if you'd like um, and pick your emoji of choice to celebrate how awesome that was. Um, thank you for such a great piece. Um, and we'll open it up to questions and I'm happy to kick things off. So. Um, one question is you, I have about a million questions as to what the parameters are that's under the 279 and the admin characteristics and 50 behavioral characteristics and sort of what is rising to the top and actually being useful and informative in those spaces. But then um, a second piece to that is, is there an opportunity to understand more about the course from the LMS? Currently, it looks like you're focusing on the student behavior in the LMS. What could we know about the course from an LMS is something I'm, I'm curious about. All right, that's a great question. So in response to your first question, uh, I haven't put it in the slide, but we actually did some in the, in the paper. You can find more in the paper. Like uh, we, we did some, you know, uh, so, so one, the the list of predictors really represent everything that we can come up with um, that, that all are also available across different courses um, based on the literature. You know, a lot of the admin, like a lot of admin, uh, admin predictors include uh, background information, the prior academic history, and some of the uh, variables derived from their current like course taking and, uh, and trajectories and stuff. And LMS predictors are more about like, like you know, they're, their their overall engagement, their time, uh, their efforts spent on different um, types of activities and, and things like that. But we we you know, but but the important thing is like um, we we did some feature importance analysis, right? Trying to identify which among these like several hundred predictors are more important in predicting student outcomes. Um, one thing I want to note is that in admin among admin predictors, uh, we yes we see a lot we, we see a lot 
uh, about like, okay, these admin predictors are better at predicting student performance, uh, uh, you know, especially for returning students. But actually what rises to the top here is usually students' cumulative GPA right, prior to the target course. So I think it's not surprising at all. And, 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 but on the other hand, we're, we're thinking of like practical uh, utility, right? Like, so especially when we don't really have, so that's why when we don't have like, you know, uh, some of the admin predictors like the cumulative GPA, right? The performance were reduced to, uh, by a significant extent and it would not be as informative um, as uh, LMS data. So that's in response to her, to her you know, so that's basically, you know, re re reaffirming some of the, some of our, our, our assumption, right? That prior GPA predicts your current course performance very well. But that's, but whether, how, how useful that is, uh, you know, that, that is a finding, uh, as a finding, I think it's up to the actual uh, practitioner's uh, use case, right? Um, another part about like, uh, not the other question about like instructional design, Yes, we have not done, we haven't done that in this study, um, but I'm actually have a separate having a separate project trying to systematically identify it, both instructional design and instructor behavior uh, in uh, this LMS context. So that's another part that shapes individual students' behavior, right? Um, to so yes, the data allows us to do that, but it does it does you know involve a lot of feature engineering and uh, data engineering uh, pieces, and also. Uh, from my observation of the existing literature, the you know analytics of instructional behavior and design is much much less uh, than the focus on student behavior. And I think we should do more of that, especially when when it comes to this kind of campus level analytics across a lot of you know different instructional contexts. It's fantastic. Thank you. You certainly found an open space, Andy. <laughs> you take it. Yeah, excellent, excellent talk. Uh, I had two questions, um, both uh, related. Uh, one was the, um, I guess, the prediction window uh, for these models. So, like, I can predict anybody's success at week fifteen for week sixteen course. So I'm curious, like, um, what you know, what is the window for these models? Uh, mm -hmm. And then two, um, uh, did you all explore like the calibration of these models, meaning like? did a prediction of a 70% failure rate actually accord with an observed failure rate around 70%. Um, and so you could take a lower AUC model if it's better calibrated. And so like trying to get a sense of uh, some of the decision-making you made around the, uh, those ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you for the questions. Uh, so in response to the first one, uh, in this study, uh, we, we, so we have early term predictors. Uh, so we actually chose or define early term as the first quarter of uh, the course period. Because in this context, uh, each college and it, even each course has a little bit different like course period. Uh, so there's, it's not like on a common like 16 week kind of system, like some courses are short, shorter, like eight weeks or something like that. So across all these courses, we chose to use a quarter, like one fourth of the course period uh, as a prediction window. Um, but actually in, in further communication with the practitioners and with some instructors, they have really expressed the interest of, you know, in, in, in predicting performance in weeks two or three. Uh, I think that's according to their needs. So in future, in future work, we're gonna kind of align this more to uh, what instructors really think um, as you know, the critical window uh, to build into this predict analytics. Um, the, the second one, so we have not looked at calibration in this specific paper. I, I think that's a good point. Uh, we'll be looking at it later. Um, I think my collaborators, they had another paper that I'm not that I'm not on that that was solely build up build that that's that's solely building predictive analytics using admin data only. I think they look at some that paper looked at some calibration metrics, um, but I don't I don't remember like the takeaway from that. Mark, you want to go next? Yeah, uh, thank you for the talk. That was really useful. I think that's much, much needed, welcomed research. Uh, you know, I, honestly, I'm kind of, I was surprised, but also not really surprised at the difference between the admin and, and the LMS data. 
Um, you know, I mean, I, I guess I would have expected the LMS to be a little bit more predictive utility, but then it can, uh, so I guess I, I, I think that the structure of that data can sometimes make it a little bit more difficult to find signal. And so I guess I'm wondering if, you know, what, what role this, so I guess I'm seeing, you know, maybe one, maybe two or a handful of rows per student for the admin data, but many, many, many rows per student for the LMS data. And I just wonder if the structure of the data has to do with the predictive utility difference that you're seeing. Oh, in prediction, we reduce everything to a student by course level prediction. Um, so, you know, it's all reduced, right, to a bunch of columns in the data set, uh, a bunch of predictors from admin, from LMS for each student in each course. Okay, I get you. Becky? Yeah, so I was interested in this, um, the course level comparisons that you were making between like English and math and bio. Um, and I was noting like the lower rates of the LMS usage in math, um, in particular versus English. And I sort of get the sense that, I mean, it's very specific to focus on math, but it is kind of like very central to the introductory experience. So I think it's sort of, it is sort of worth thinking about on its own. And I, I get this, I get a, a vague sense that like, math as a, as a discipline um sort of sometimes just doesn't use the lms like um i don't know in my experience at a couple of universities i've seen you know like we don't use the lms we just go to the go to this like course website and there's kind of this thread of using course websites a lot and so i was just wondering like did you see anything more systematic like that about math or about any other discipline that like you know regardless of the institution courses in this discipline kind of tend to use the LMS less or more? Yeah, that's not, so that's not part of um, this study, but that's definitely something I'm interested in, right? Like there are definitely systematic differences in LMS usage beyond like individual, like structured decision, right? There's like discipline, disciplinary differences and all that kind of things. Um, and with this kind of data available to every, almost every single institution, there is, you know, technically the possibility um, to look at those, right? Uh, so, cool. welcoming other questions. One I have is: Is there any piece of data that has shown to be important that you were surprised by, or the inverse? Anything you thought was going to be important and doesn't seem to be when you look at features? Um. Well, actually, for this study, I think it's most so. So this study is preliminary, and so far, and I think because I did a lot of like this kind of research in the past with smaller sample size, I think this study is mostly confirming a lot of like my previous findings on a smaller scale. Uh, that okay, showing some um surprising thing, but overall, I I think that resonated with uh, I think and and Andrew Mark's uh, comment that I was expecting the predictability of, of LMS data to be higher uh, originally. Um, like, like, yes, I know like, you know, the admin data, including cumulative GPA would definitely be almost perfect or whatever um, predictor of current performance. But I, was, I wasn't I was expecting that LMS data, the comparative utility of LMS data, uh, you know, to be that kind of weak. Um, but I think it also has something to do you know, his, this first this first study, we did some really, you know, we didn't spend a, you know, we could have spent another year or two like just doing the feature engineering, like, you know, the, but the, for the sake of the first study, we're just like doing some intuitive uh, metrics and, and, and other kind of stuff. Um, so I think there's still room for that, for the improvement of, of that. Like overall, I would say overall, the feature engineer for admin data in this paper is more, careful than the LMS feature engineering. So I, I don't know, I don't know how much further it can be improved, um, but I, I assume there's room. That's really helpful. Um, okay, so Stephanie has a question. Is there a source where we can see the full references so we can look up those studies as well? You have oh, work, right? Yeah, we'll have a working paper. Would you be able to share that? Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's already on. Let me, let me, let me pull that link. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so if I'm interpreting your prior work 
that highlighted that the LMS might actually present a more equitable lens on things against this, then if you were to do this analysis, but break it down by different populations, do you think you'd see different results? That's what I mean. That's that's what we're working on, and that I hopefully, I I I I I hope to see right. Like, yeah. is that's why I was, you know, after after that study, I was you know really, you know, more like a, I confirmed my belief in the utility of of this kind of data, right? Because I, I mentioned that there's a lot of like you know, cons of LMS data, right? Like it's not like a learning system. And, you know, if you if you're a kind of psychologist, you probably don't benefit as much from the data. But but from a, especially from an institutional practical view, it's a really good source of data overall, and it's there. Like you don't have you, you need to in, invest in the management and the analytics, but you don't need to do any data collection because it's there, right? Um, so I hope to see that kind of a finding that they actually lead to more kind of fair predictions. Great. Stephanie? Um, yeah, I mean, my question is the one I always have when people start dealing with prediction models is, um, and so I'm glad what you found about the LMS, because all the demographic variables and the things that the institution knows about the student aren't anything that aren't anything that student can change. But their behavior, and and also of course those um, prediction models are based on historic data, when you know there's already bias in a lot of ways about equity from where the data is being, you know who those students represented in that a in that uh, data set is. So the LMS at least, and also an early intervention, you can do an early intervention based on a, on just demographic factors, except to say forget it, you'll never pass this course, right? Because you can't change your gender or you you can't change your family's uh, income level or, you know, that kind of thing. So um, so anyway, so that that's what makes me happier about the LMS data, even though we all know that LMS data is not really great in a lot of other respects. Mm -hmm. So that yeah, wasn't really that was it was a soapbox, sorry. <laughs> And, and it actually related to, you know, the kind of historical bias uh, perspective, you know, the, the, the study that it did before was, uh, you know, where, where I found like, you know, using admin data would lead to more biased predictions that was actually controlling for existing, you know, different group differences. Like, right, we, we definitely don't want, want, want we, you know, given the current inequalities, we definitely don't want the models to give for example, racial minorities and white students, the same love, the same rate of success, because in practice, right, like with existing qualities, they're not succeeding at the same rate. But the problem here is that they tend to give racial minorities more at risk, higher at higher risk factors than they actually have. So that's a little bit concerning. Uh, you know, like so, so there, there are two layers of inequalities here, right? like in, existing inequalities and the additional layer of inequality that the models can, can add to. Stephanie, you're muted. Sorry. I was just going to say, I think it's really important work that you're doing. Um, and I know um, you've got an award at the recent LAC conference, right? Oh, so, thank you. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. And I and I think that that reflects the, um, the community's uh, values regarding ethics and thinking about how we can increase equity in education. And for me to see someone who's dealing with prediction models put that for in the forefront, uh, I'm I really applaud that that effort. And I'm, I'm happy to hear you talking about it. Thank you, Stephanie. Any more questions? Well, then I think that is a perfect note to wrap things up. Um, and I'd invite people to take another moment to celebrate Dr. Yu's fantastic work and sharing of that today. Um, and thank you all for joining us. I really do hope we will see as many of you as possible on April 26th in person. Have a wonderful day. Thank you again for having me. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.